Hello scholars, welcome back. This is chapter 10, as you can see, on Tensoi and D'Angelo. This is one of my favorite chapters. I like dealing with the idea of social class because it is so important, such an important topic in American society today because we like to pretend we don't have any social class, but we do. So we're going to talk about understanding intersectionality through classism. Now remember, because I don't know if I had a chance to prepare a slide specifically on intersectionality, so I'll say it up front and hopefully I'll get it back around to it. Intersectionality is understanding the isms in light of one another. So, for example, how does race affect a woman? So, in other words, what are the differences and experiences between a European American woman that's middle class than an African American woman that lives in the inner city below the poverty line? We have to think about how race and sex intersect with one another and cause each of those women to have different experiences. And then the third piece, social class, which we're going to talk about today, that poverty. So how does that affect a woman of color? So it's not really proper or correct to say, I'm just oh, as oppressed as a black person because I'm a woman. Uh, a white woman that says something like that does not understand intersectionality. Now, we're not saying that that individual does not experience sexism because they do on a regular basis. I mean, men are pigs. I was just telling my daughter that men can be real jerks and feel entitled to a woman's body or a woman to say certain things to a woman and think that they it's just a joke and they can get away with it. So women experience sexism all of the time. But understand, when you throw race and poverty into the factor, it's going to be different experiences. So, okay, that's my talk about intersectionality. Let me move forward. What is social class? So the primary goal of this particular lecture is to understand social class. Now I'm going, now I'm going to ask you to be grabbing your book from time to time because we're going to be looking at certain passages that really are going to help us bring out key concepts and key ideas on social class. But a division of society based on social and economic status. Okay, so how society is divided based on how much money someone has in their social class. Social class has to do with their social standing, have to do with things like access to college, access to debutante balls, and access to fraternal orders, and access to certain jobs, and certain types of jobs, access to educational resources for college, all of these things are attached to a certain social class. Access to country to country day schools, to private schools, even the knowledge of what the best schools are are so associated with the upper class. People from different social classes and walks of life. Also a set of subjectively defined concepts. You notice that word subjectively, that means they have no objective basis they're arbitrary, but we insist that it's the natural order of things. Uh, political theory centered on models of social stratification. That means people of different levels and status in society stratification, attaching importance to a certain group. A hierarchy, there's another word there, the most common being upper, middle, and lower. Social class is a social construct. So there's a comic strip 
On page 158, figure 10.1, called the boss. <coughs> Excuse me. And the boss says, I'll just read a little bit of while I'll read it. It says, what did you tell that man just now? And, he's, and he, the boss tells him, I told him to work faster. And this is the sort of socialist guy in the comic book have, asking him a question. He says, how much did you pay him? And the boss says, $25 an hour. The other guy says, where did you get the money to pay him? And the boss says, sell products. Or this is the owner. Who makes the products? He does, says the owner. How many products does he make in one day? The owner says, $100 worth. So you see what he's getting at. And instead of you paying him, he's paying you $75 a day to tell him to work faster. <laughs> then the the that flabbergasted the owner, he says, huh? But the machines belong to me, says the owner. How did you get the machines? I sold products and bought them, he says proudly. And who made those products? And finally, the owner says, shut up, he might hear you. So... Um, I think that's interesting about social class. Um, that's actually a, a Marxist ideology uh, there um, to look at who makes the, who produces the product, who owns the means of production. And there's another interesting chart on page 159 that deals with social class. You see there, the average CEO in Norway makes $2,551,000, $2,551,420. The average CEO in the United States makes over $12 million, where the average worker is gets paid the least. See, I didn't know this. In the industrialized world, Norway, Netherlands, United Kingdom, Germany, Canada, Keep in mind, I'm on, on the part, the chart at the top of page 159. You notice that the low person on the total pole, in terms of wage earners and compensation, is the Americans for just under 35,000. That's pretty sad. All right, let's move on. Nowadays, it's white men who are the victims. Pretty soon, the white race will be the minority. Black people are taking over. Have you ever heard these statements? Have you found yourself saying or thinking the above statement? What is the rationale for such statements and thinking? What role might Eurocentric thinking or white supremacist ideology play in driving such statements? Um, many people have said that. But what I want to say is why the preoccupation with the European American race remaining the majority. I've had a lot of friends say pretty soon in such and such year whites will be the minority. European Americans will be the minority. And then I thought about the NWA song Fear of a Black Planet. There's this fear that it's, some, it's unfounded that somehow when black folks or brown folks get in a position of power or they get in the majority of majority uh, position, they're going to somehow take over the world and enslave white folks. There's a the fear that comes from racism and the legacy of white supremacy. And so even this idea that white men are the victims, come, it's wrong-headed thinking um, because any conversation that has to do with multiculturalism and trying to level the playing field and talk about equity and equality um, black and brown folks, people get uncomfortable when they say white men are being oppressed. So, um, Eurocentric thinking is thinking that Euro European culture is superior to every other culture. So that's what I say there in, in uh, number three. Um, so this fits with this idea that, um, if we have a black president, they're going to uh, all, like when we had Obama, all of his policies, people were afraid that he would 
have all his policies before black folks. Of course, that wasn't the case. This is kind of a racist, excuse me, I'm uh, doing this late at night. This is kind of a racist cartoon because it said that uh, Obama was too easy on immigration. He's basically inviting them right in with the, with the, uh, the Constitution as the uh, as the doormat, <laughs> as the doormat um, of where they can wipe their feet on. He said, don't forget to wipe your feet. And he's doing it by executive order. So he's forcing everybody as a tyrant, the way he's portrayed. And look how dark they made him. What, you know, that is not even his skin tone, but I'm an African American. And so that's going to stand right out to me. And we know that if you make someone look darker, a lot of folks uh, get uncomfortable. A lot of non-black and brown folks get uncomfortable when somebody has dark skin. Um, It's another cartoon. You speaking English? I do if you want to learn it. Just give me a call. And so there's this idea that None of the foreigners will come over being able to speak English and that they should just learn our language, quote unquote. And that's that's just a ridiculous notion here. And many times foreigners can speak better English than uh, the average American, which is hilarious. And then we have all these stereotypes about immigrants, that they're rapists, that they're uncivilized. And I love this here, the cartoon to the right. Why can't immigrants get dressed like civilized people? You see the woman, she's dressed very so-called respectable. <laughs> In the Americans, we just put anything on. So I love that picture. It deals with some of the classism and racism. Um, and, and I just wanted to add this, too, in terms of talking about racism. Uh, we've been seeing this term, black cultural appropriation, Perhaps you've seen it on the internet, perhaps not. But what it means is borrowing from black culture, uh, but not loving the people, not really fighting for for education, not really fighting for childhood hunger, not supporting black people for real, but just taking their talents and using them all up and not really appreciate the people like rap music people that like rap music they often don't have any african-american friends and they would be entertained they love the music but they never advocate for the cause of african-americans and i wanted you to take a look at we're not going to read the whole thing we're not I'm, in fact i'm not i'm barely going to read any of it this this uh allegory is so beautiful because it deals with Mr. Rich, white, Mr. Poor, white, and then also the middle class. And it basically talks about how it goes back to, this goes back to the time of slaves, how does the, the rich, wealthy turn the poor whites against the African Americans. And they united in their white supremacy. And the Caucasian and the middle class uh, Caucasian person came in and they only wanted to do things according to their interests. So that's interest conversion, like a critical race. So they wanted, um, in in the text, uh, the middle class wanted things that benefited them only. And so go back and read that story. I kind of butchered that there, but. Go back and read that story. I think you'll get a lot out of it. Consider what the allegory teaches about the intersection of race and social class. And so the poor was, you know, you language we would use in this class, the poor in, in this particular uh, scenario um, was low man on the totem pole, but he wasn't lower than the black man. He still had his white privilege, which I think is fascinating. We talked about this. I had this is a repeat, so this we'll skip right through that.
social class. And so here are some, I like these pyramids. You notice that the top 14% is the upper class. And look, look how big lower middle through lower class is. So first of all, lower semi-professionals with an average standard of living, some college education. Then blue collar with low job security, high risk poverty. Then they rely on government transfers, occupy poorly paid jobs. So that's a 40, that's, that's almost 75% of the people in this, our society that are lower class or lower. For 14% of the other upper class and then not the elite of the 14%. And see, you see the names here, elite, upper class, middle class, lower middle, poor class, homeless, unemployed. So you see that there. What is classism? The institutional, cultural, and individual set of practices that assign differential value according to the socioeconomic, socioeconomic class status it ensures inequality between the classes so it's basically looking down on someone because they're poor or looking down on someone because they work in mcdonald's and we feel like we somehow better off and that uh we we're more uh evolved that's classism um looking down on folks basing that on their social economic status, where they went to school at, where they grew up at. So prejudice against individuals that are well, are, are poor. And another word they, they highlighted was common class vernacular. Certain terminology that's associated with specific social classes that generally is tied what social class one is in, but one should keep in mind that this is not hard and fast rules. So in other words, you got very wealthy people, especially if you inherited money or, or you self-made athlete or entertainer, often they will retain so-called street language. And so it doesn't hold up. But social class is more than the wealthy. But you can have somebody with money and not fit into that club, that that uh, social class. And so that's interesting, too. And then you got individuals that are not wealthy that use standard English. So it just depends. And these are some cartoons. I'm a cartoon guy. So these trousers make my butt look, look big. That's fun. Then you see the iconography here, the rich, the poor, the middle class, upper class. Uh, so this is just from history. During the Industrial Revolution of the late 1800s, when the upper class enjoyed few, enjoyed lifestyle, few could attain status based mostly on birth and land ownership. So you basically were born right into it. Social predispositions threatened by new changes Money could buy, influence, power, and respect. Common in class vernacular. Terminology that's associated with a specific social class. I believe I talked about that already. So, one of my favorite parts of the text was common misconceptions about social class. So, one of them was the first one, I kind of did them in order. And these are on page 167. The first one is we live in a classless society, classless society, where anyone can make it. From very early on in school, we're taught that anyone can make it if they try. That the West is the land of the opportunity. We hold, we're told rags to riches stories from Cinderella to Sam Walton. That we live in a classless society. The great myth of the American dream, this is page 167, is so powerful that research shows that the vast 
majority of Americans, over 70%, overestimate class mobility and believe that personal motivation is more important to mobility than the state of the economy or the economic circumstances they are born into. And so, we don't live in a classless society. That's, that's not true. Another one is a, a rich person can become poor as easily as a poor person can become rich. Because we tend to think of class strictly in terms of how much money we have, we assume that a rich person who loses everything will end up in the same boat as a poor person. But in reality, a rich person does not lose money. They don't lose everything when they lose their money. They will still have internalized sense of entitlement, contacts with other wealthy people they can call upon, and network with knowledge of systems and how to know, navigate them. So you get that. Education is getting ahead. Here's another one. I really like these. Well, while certainly there are more opportunities open to people with education, more education, education itself is also stratified. Stratified that means it's hierarchy. Uh, you have the Ivy League schools versus the two-year technical school. As discussed in Chapter 2, the kind of education we receive is based on the kind of school we go to public or private, where it's located, and how it's funded within the school or different tracks that offer different kinds of knowledge. So even schools are stratified. Sports and scholarships offer minorities a way out. The idea that sports are a way out of poverty for poor youth of color is deeply cherished and continues to be reinforced on film and television. Yet, it, it is extremely rare possibility considering the following so it's a considered it's an extremely rare possibility for many per folks of color to go to college so look at this consider the following how many openings on professional teams are actually available take basketball as an example there are five positions on the team with seven extra players for a total of 12 players there are 11 players on the football team baseball is played with nine players the de degree of exceptionality required to make it onto the field for these teams is very high. The possibility of women making it through sports is even more limited, given that their teams do not have the visibility or bring in the kind of wealth that men's teams do. It's much easier to go to a four-year college and get a full ride of academics than it is to you have a better chance than you do with a sports scholarship. And then folks also say cl class is the true oppression. If we eliminate classes, we eliminate racism. But of course, that ignores intersectionality, which we talked about already. But there are different things that race bring about that class does not in terms of phenotype. If somebody looks at me, I'm an African-American male professor, they might read me as a thug because I'm black if I'm dressed a certain way. And people just need to work hard and not expect handouts. That assumes everybody is on the same, comes at the same level playing field, but they just don't. So, and then the myth, anyone who wants to get a job can, that's not true as well. I struggled for a long time in my youth trying to find work, and, and it was tough. So I didn't grow up in a good neighborhood. Common classes beliefs prejudice against folks that are of a low SES. Now I want you to encourage you to go back. I want to encourage you to go back and look at these two on your own. Immigrants are still in our jobs. And this is, uh, this is also in the text. You can find this up there in chapter 10. Starting on page 178. Immigrants do not and cannot steal jobs. Rather, immigrants tend to cluster in the very vocations and jobs that locally born people don't want to do. These immigrants are hired by companies who chose to hire them and benefit from their cheap or exploited labor. The work they do is typically the most grueling, demeaning, and dangerous work that others have refused to do was that unionized workers have collectively, collectively bargained against doing under safe, doing under 
They refuse to do it under unsafe conditions. Here's another one. Poor people should stop having so many babies. This claim rests on the assumption that women have complete control over their bodies and receive no pressure from society to be sexual, much less pressure or even force from men to engage in, in unprotected sex. Furthermore, many of the forms of birth control available to women can be dangerous, fatal, expensive, and difficult to access. Perhaps the simplest, cheapest, and safest form of birth control beyond abstinence, which again assumes women are the sole decision makers and whether or not they have sex, is to use condoms. But condom use depends on men being willing to use them. And so, in other words, women aren't purposely having babies just to get a check. That's a myth, too. It's easy when you get a government handout every month. It is a common stereotype that indigenous people get free money from the government. People of color, African Americans in particular, are beneficiaries of welfare and other handout programs. That's the common thought that black folks are taking advantage of the system. When considering this further, it is a common stereotype that these groups cheat these programs. When considering this belief, we need to look at several interrelated dynamics. Historical oppression, what programs are actually available, and who uses them. When we think of a historical oppression towards African Americans in the United States, we consider the following in terms of stolen goods. It's by no means an exhaustive list. African Americans were kidnapped 246 years of enslavement, brutality, the rape of black women, torture, separation of families, selling of children, forbidden to speak their own language or practice their religion, medical experimentation, slave codes, black codes, mandatory segregation, lynching, murder, mob violence, imprisonment, I could go on and on. Redlining to profit banks, real estate brokers, documented discrimination in employment, biased laws, policing practices, white flight, cultural insurance, cultural erasure. The wealth of Canada and the United States absolutely depended on and can continues to be depended on was stolen from these groups. The wealth was stolen from these groups. There's widespread information, misinformation about what government assistance programs support are actually in place and who uses them. For example, many people think that citizens who receive welfare benefits live lives of luxury, that black people in particular abuse the welfare system. Yet, in fact, to qualify for welfare officially, you need to have income below half the poverty line. So nobody's getting rich off of the system. So you can see on and on. There's some other ones I want you to take a look at. I'm going to stop right here. This is my time. I hope you take a look at these. Don't forget to look at these lectures there's things that i want you to know specifically for the quiz but also just for your own knowledge until next time thank you so much